All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast and the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. I'm Doug Norrie, owner-operator, DFSR.com. If you need some projections for FanDuel or DraftKings, head on over to DFSR.com. we got you covered over there. Every single sport, whatever the season, you need some projections over there, we got you covered down to the very last bench player. No Adam Armbrecht on the podcast today. He's got some other commitments, basically for the rest of the week. So I'm going to be flying a little bit solo, not a little bit, a lot of bit solo um, for the rest of the week. That's okay, we got you covered. This one coming at you right after the Nets take on the Knicks. They win at 112 to 110, and this was as good of a game as you really want to see in the NBA. National TV in Brooklyn, crosstown rivalry, a lot of Knicks fans in in the arena as well in the Barclays or the Clays as I you know more commonly and affectionately called now. And it really kind of just gives you all the emotion all the energy you want, a game of runs for sure, where, you know, Nets come out looking good really early, Knicks storm back, Knicks are, you know, so feisty, uh, just such a, a tough team, and they really make a game of it in what ends up being a sort of down, not even sort of, a down to the last buzzer game, which, look, if that's what you're coming to watch basketball for, this is what you're coming to watch basketball for, this is really everything you want out of a game, and the Nets are able to take, a, you know, an important victory for them. It's important for them to put the stamp on New York to make sure, you know, not to give Knicks fans or you know the media any fire to to stoke here about who kind of owns the city or runs the city at this point, which is something that folks really usually want to make a pretty big deal out of. I don't we don't do too much of it on the podcast here, but in the end, this game is exactly what you want out of a basketball game, and, and we got it, and it's really kind of all you can hope for when you tune in on a Tuesday night national TV, like I said. So the Nets uh, end up taking the game, and it's kind of a tale of two superstars in this game when it came to the Nets. And it's going to be the theme for us a lot of this year is that when you do a podcast that has James Harden and Kevin Durant on the team that you do a podcast for, that is going to be who dominates the discussion uh, most times. That's just the way it is. Um, this isn't new. We're not reinventing the wheel from that standpoint. But this game was really interesting because it was like the Nets needed everything from each guy, but just at different stages in the game. The game starts right away where Harden kind of just, I mean, completely takes control to start this game. Uh, he had 28 by halftime. I think he had 24, like sort of midway through the second. He looked fully in control. We talked last time about how Harden himself had said, and they made a little bit of a deal about this on the national broadcast. We talked about it a lot, or two podcasts ago, where Harden had said he was kind of struggling to find his way in the offense, how to facilitate the offense, where he was like feeling maybe a little confused. Things weren't flowing the way that he's so he's used to having it done. And we talked about why that might be happening. You know, you lose a little bit of a step. Uh, we talked about sort of sometimes the re- not the reliance, but how his game is really advantageous when he is working with a rolling big man, especially an athletic one. And they just really haven't been able to find that. So it kind of made sense to us why Harden would say that or what sort of his some of his troubles to start the season would be. And like basketball will often do for you, you can erase narratives really quickly. Like this is like kind of the story of a basketball season. You want to, you watch games all year, you follow basketball all year. The narratives are just going to change really, really quickly based on things that happen. It's sort of, it's just if you want. To, I've said it before. It was a game of runs. I mean, sometimes the season can be like this too. You can go through these mini runs of looking very confident as a team, and then you know things start to flag a little bit as other teams you know, figure you out or. You know, whether you just kind of maybe run bad an offense or defense or whatever it is, games can be set up and runs, seasons can too. And so it takes basically one game for some of that hardened narrative, maybe basically not even a game, it takes basically a half for the hardened narrative to sort of flip back. And then you, he reminds you that, yeah, when he's dialed in, he's super, super dangerous. And it's why it's so important to have two superstars on this team like this, because you can weather the storm of when one is struggling to find his game a little bit. And that was the case for this game. For sure, Harden completely takes over the first half. Um, He ends up with 34 points, 10 rebounds, 8 assists. 
Uh, he did turn the ball over five times, but that was in 40 minutes. You can take it for how long he was just uh, on the court for. And he's a big reason, one, that they jump out to a to an early lead. Um, and then, two, where they kind of open up a lead in the beginning of the third quarter as well. They go on a 14 to nothing run at the beginning of the third. And, uh, and you know, it ended up really mattering because the game ended up being so close. So this is when you're, if you're a Nets fan, or you're watching Nets games, like this is, again, a reminder, like you need to see these things. Now, it'd be nice if it would, this was a little more of a consistent, if it had been, because we've seen flashes of this from Harden during the season, where it's been like, okay, well, it's looking good here, and then it kind of drifts back into like what we saw last game with Phoenix, where it was just a turnover fest, and it really looked like he was struggling. This is that nice reminder, is that when you have James Harden, playing his game, which is being super decisive, getting guys into switches around the perimeter, which he was doing, taking it to the basket really strong, which he was doing tonight, drawing a lot of fouls. He goes to the line 10 times overall. A lot of those were in the first half. And you're getting that, I'm going to call it vintage James Harden here, that you kind of really need to see to start feeling good about the Nets long term. And it's been, man, look, we talked about it. It's not been something that they've brought every single, he's brought every single game. But when you get to see it, like you do here against the Knicks, you're reminded, okay, right, when he's on his game, he's incredibly difficult to defend. He makes it a lot easier for everyone else in the lineup. He get, They're going to get baskets of like easier nature at the rim because he's going to, he can get to the rim just easier and he's able to finish really strongly at the rim. He's able to draw those fouls. He's able to slow the game down when he needs to. And he just looked very decisive in the first half, which is exactly what you're hoping to see. Again, national media game, a lot of people watching, New York City, Knicks, all the stuff that you want to do from the narrative perspective, and he completely showed up. So this was a really nice sort of bounce back game from him after a real struggle against Phoenix over the weekend and basically exactly what you needed to see out of him to feel really good. Play good defense also. I thought, like, I mean, there was, we could talk a little bit late game stuff that there were some struggles from the Nets, but overall, he was effective. Like, when he got caught on switches in the post, he's pretty effective. We know he's a good defender there, and the Knicks are going to try to sort of seek that out at times. But overall, this was the exact James Harden game you wanted to see because we'll talk about this in a second. This was a game that Kevin Durant really struggled. And when he's struggling, a lot of times, if Kevin Durant's in your team and Kevin Durant's struggling, your team is going to be in trouble. They weren't in this game because James Harden was able to fully dominate at least the first half of it. And then sort of they were able to bide their time until KD could get them back into it. So we'll get into the Kevin Durant piece of this in a second. First, going to talk to you about our friends over at Indeed. If you need a hiring partner that gets you what you really want, you need that short list of quality candidates as fast as possible. Because you can do it all. You want to attract, interview, and hire. You can do that all at Indeed. You don't need to struggle on your own to try to find the quality candidates that you need for your company. They indeed can help you hire the right people right now. Indeed partners with you in every step of the hiring process. You can find the talent with the skills you need through tools like the Indeed Instant Match, assessments, virtual interviews. It's all there on the Indeed platform. They make it very easy for you. If you are in the hiring or in charge of hiring for your company, you have to get on board with Indeed right now. Simplify the entire process. You can get started right now. $75 sponsor job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash locked. Just like our podcast network, get a $75 credit at indeed.com slash locked indeed.com slash lock offer valid through December 31st terms and conditions apply needs a hire. You need indeed. And you know, Show can't go by without us talking about Built Bar. Look, we're through Thanksgiving right now. It's over. Um, you, maybe you enjoyed some Built Bar instead of the pie like we re- recommended. It's okay. Now you're in cut and calorie mode. Now you're in exercise mode. Now you're in protein mode. As you get through the holidays, you got to head on over and grab yourself a Built Bar. It's perfect time for Built Bar. Now through the holidays, low carbs, low calorie, low fat, high protein. Those are the superlatives you want to hear from something you can grab on the go, 100% covered in real chocolate, which when you get that, you're like, how are these things healthy? Well, that's because the stats back it up. Like I said, the calories range in that like 120 to 140 range, um, and the protein is as high as can be. They have new surprises all month with limited time flavors coming at built.com. 
built.com. So make sure you're checking the site built.com. You want to use the promo code locked 15 for 15% off your order. Use promo code locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, Kevin Durant. This one was not a great game for him early, especially he was struggling from the field all night. He did not make a three, 0 for 5 from three-pointer. You are not going to see many games like that from Kevin Durant. The guy, it's not a big stage thing. I know a couple of his bigger games this season on national television have not been his best. Uh, it's just going to happen. This I Clearly, this is not a national TV narrative for a guy like Kevin Durant. So I saw you know, a few people talking about that. I don't think we need to make that really a talking point. But it was his, it, what is a talking point was that this game was just not one of his best. He struggled from the field. He had, and it wasn't because the looks weren't good. The looks were Kevin Durant looks that you want to see for the most part from him. And they just really weren't going down. Look, it's basketball. It happens. Kevin Durant is not infallible here. He's having one of the greatest shooting statistical shooting seasons of all time up until this point. The effective field goal percentage is up through the roof. We've seen the shot charts. The mid-range game is nuts. He's getting to the rim when he wants, the three-point, everything. It's, it's, it's all been working for him. There's a reason why he's on the short list of MVP candidates so far to start the season. You know, behind Curry for sure, but in that very small group of players that are having good enough seasons to be talked about when it comes to the MVP. This just wasn't an MVP-type performance from him, and... It's okay. We talk about a game of runs and a game uh, that can get streaky at times. You can struggle from the field a little bit, even if you're Kevin Durant. They talked about it on the national media broadcast on TNT. They said he was one of the first guys uh, out of the tunnel to start the second half when or when they were warming up for the second half, taking shots because he knows. Like this guy is a scientist when it comes to shooting. He's you know whatever it is, a magician, a scientist, whatever, someone that can just do extraordinary things given uh, the resources at their disposal, Kevin Durant is definitely one of those guys. And he's going to know when it's, he's going to know more than anybody when he's struggling. And this is one of those games now with Kevin Durant, because he's so good. What you get is if you give him enough minutes, the (laughs) regression comes to get us all or comes to get you New York Knicks at some point. And that's what happened with Durant in this game where he He goes out there for 41 minutes, and the fourth quarter was his time. When the shots were the most important is when Kevin Durant started making his shots. And this is what superstars do. You can struggle. If you're going to struggle for a half, it's going to be rare that you struggle for an entire game. If if the game is going to stay tight and he's going to continue to stay on the floor, he's going to keep shooting. That, That will always be the case. And when the spotlight or the you know the light was shining down the brightest, and when they needed the baskets the most, Durant was the one that was able to deliver. Hit a lot of shots down the, down the stretch. Again, a lot of the same shots he was getting for most of the game. These ones just ended up going down. And when um, when it kind of came push came to shove, he was able to get a couple. And this was again, look, he missed dunks. He missed two dunks, really. They got kind of lucky with uh, with the Derrick Rose foul that it ended up getting reviewed. Um, and I don't think... It's probably one of those ones where they probably shouldn't have called it in the moment. But when you go and actually look at the tape, you can call it a foul. And it was such a brush foul that I can see why Knicks fans would probably be a little annoyed by it. So he misses that dunk. He missed one earlier in the game when he took a while to get up. And I it was I don't know if you were watching this with me, but he went down off that missed dunk and he did not come back into the screen for a long time. And I know it was because it was a transition. I think he thought the ball was just going to go in and he was probably cherry picking a little bit to see if he could get one back. But every second that he didn't come back onto the onto the screen was a sort of a hold your breath moment. But in the end, um, they ran a couple of actions toward him. Um, they ran uh, one off a double screen that he was able to get a good shot off of. They gave him the ball uh, twice in the post late game, even though it wasn't even a total mismatch. It was just sort of ISO post stuff that they wanted to make sure they got on the ball because when the game is on the line, this is who you want to have the ball every single time. And so Durant ultimately 
it's funny because he finishes with 27 points. And I said, like I said before, he didn't make a three. He did get to the line nine times. One was on that, you know, un- well, fortunate for the Nets off the technical of Julius Randle late and late in the game that re- that actually ended up helping the Nets a lot too. So he doesn't finish with 27 points. He was able to facilitate a little more offense. He did have nine assists, which is important because when the shot's not dropping completely, it's nice to know that he's, I mean, obviously able to distribute and facilitate in a way that's still going to help the Nets. And so this is why you have Kevin Durant. You have Kevin Durant because the understanding is that while there will be some times where it's not looking great and the shot is just not falling, like I said before, give some, give him the whole game and we'll see if that ends up being the case. And most times it's just not going to be. It's just not going to be the case. He's just not going to have, like, if you give him 41 minutes, the the, the 27 points is probably, I am i don't know, want to say how low it is in terms of where it stands on the bell curve of, of outcomes, but it's not going to be, it's going to be on the, like, the very left end because he's just, he's just too good. And the Knicks are, they, they get to witness that in person. It's not like they don't know. But he uh, he ends up going, you know, he goes to the line a couple times. He makes a 15 foot jumper with about five minutes left that gave them. Uh, this is when they were kind of going back and forth and trading baskets between him and Derrick Rose. Uh, he hit that, then he made another uh, little pull up jumper with the three minutes left that gave him the lead back, and they're kind of trading back baskets still. They ran the Patty Mills. Um, action where James Johnson got on the assist and then Durant hits another one with 137 and then they get toward the end of the game goes to the foul line a couple more times and this is again it's like the sort of the volume shooting that ends up going down um, and this is where you always feel good as a Nets fan because you're like well if we just have this guy and he's the one that's going to take shots late in the games then we're going to feel pretty good about it so in the end kind of a, a, a tale of two superstar games between him and Harden this is why you have both. You'd like to have the third in Kyrie. He's still not here. But in the end, when you have these two guys on your team, this is mostly what you're going to get. want to talk a little bit more about what this mean, this game means for the Nets. Um, you know, a, win, a win is a win is a win. But sometimes wins kind of mean a little bit more. I think we can all agree on that one. First, got to talk to you about our friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered all season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Tramping through football season and basketball season, uh, both in the March of the playoffs, but football coming a little earlier. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all your sports action this season. Head on over, check out the updated desktop and mobile website they have over at Bet Online. You sign up today, you can do that totally for free, but you are going to want to make a deposit when you do. Grab a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code LOCKED ON, just like our podcast network, to receive your bonus. Basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, you name it. Right down to Vegas casino games. Take advantage of all the amazing offers through the rest of the 2021 season. Bet online, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. All right, a couple other final thoughts here from this one. Uh, besides just James Harden and Kevin Durant, other players do play for the Nets here, um, and it's big games for all these guys too. A couple of like I think things that we get some of these I'm going to deal with a little bit more later in the week about some of the rotations because I think there were some interesting moves on the part of Steve Nash and company in this game. I uh, haven't listened to the post game presser yet, but. He'll probably end up commenting on a couple of these moves. First, Cam Thomas was very important in this one off the bench. Comes in, again, you're getting exactly what we kind of thought we had drafted and signed up for uh, through Summer League, which is microwave scoring when you need it the most. And his scoring was incredibly important in this game because when Kevin Durant is struggling in that first half, Thomas ends up being one of the catalyst for the offense to help make up some of the difference he ends up going five for nine from the field two for four from three hit some big shots looked very confident also able to shoot some gaps on the defensive end had i know he only had one rebound but the rebound he actually had was a box out on mitrov and it ended up going into a transition he has a steal too he actually when i see those stats it, it kind of surprises me a little bit because i thought he was so active on other parts of his game besides just the scoring that I would have 
if without looking, would have guessed it was more <laughs> than one rebound and one steal, just based on the overall activity. And I think we basically closed the door on the question about whether he should have a spot, at least in the short term, in the rotation. That answer is pretty clearly yes. I think sometimes you'll live with even some of the off shooting nights, which he'll probably have. We talked about some of that regression and streakiness. You will have some off nights from him for sure. It's just the nature of his game. But his game and his scoring was so important in this one right when the Nets needed it. And you really can't say enough. This is You talk about a big stage, national TV, like I said, New York game. These guys know it. These guys know what they're walking into. Some guys are going to feed off it, and it looks like Cam Thomas – I don't know. If, I don't. I don't know if players play better in situations like this, but you at least know the ones that aren't afraid to do it. And I think at this point, we can probably say, pretty definitively, that Cam Thomas is not afraid of this kind of spotlight. And there was a couple other interesting things that happened in this one here too with him, because not only was the scoring really important for him at a time, like, like I said, the first half where the Nets needed the most, uh, Knicks were kind of making a, a storm back early on. And then later in the game, if you notice, there was a moment where Kevin Durant really got into him, where he had come, Cam had come weak side. It was in a sort of transition. It was in transition, but the Knicks had rotated back pretty quick, cross match and rotated back pretty quickly. And Cam ran to the wrong spot. And Durant ended up basically, what well, he didn't turn it over, but he threw a pass into like the teeth of the Knicks defense. And Durant let him have it. Durant like clearly said to him you that he did not make the he was standing in the wrong place. He was standing in a place where Katie was not going to be able to get him the ball. And I think that was an interesting moment for him for both these guys or really for the whole team because Katie is a great teammate and I think everyone knows that. But for him to feel comfortable sort of laying into Cam at that point and saying you know he that Thomas made a mistake, I think is done because Durant, I think, knows that he can handle it because Katie's not a Katie's not a yeller, like or you know he's intense dude, and he gets into it and he'll let you know when he's beating you, but he's not a guy that shows up teammates. He's not a guy that really you know you see getting super fired up at his own guys a lot. But and that was a situation where he clearly thought Thomas had made a mistake, and he, I think it says more that he, that Durant felt comfortable letting Thomas know. Rather than like showing him up or something, then you know, they high fived after a second of it, after they kind of went through it, and they went about their way. And I thought that was a really telling moment between them. And I think, if nothing else, or excuse me, not if nothing else, I think a sign that Thomas is like kind of here to stay in the rotation, as he should be, because these other guys feel pretty comfortable. At least KD and that did in that moment. They feel really comfortable letting him know when things are good. And also when you make mistakes, because that's how you learn. And I think that's a pretty big like sort of maturation process for a guy that already looks very mature, at least on the offensive end, on in on the basketball court in Cam Thomas. So I thought that was an interesting moment. Like I said, I, I, I'm really impressed with what he brought off the bench. They really needed it without a secondary score. We know they're going to be without a Harris for time uh, right now. We'll get, we'll get into that later in, in another podcast. But off that bench... You look at the guys that are coming off the bench right now, there's no offense to be found except for Cam Thomas. And in the NBA, when you need to spell superstars, when you need to keep your rotations um, sort of pretty fluid in terms of what you have in terms of firepower, having a guy right now for them to bring off the bench and Cam is really important, and this was a perfect example of it. So kudos to the kid. He was really, really good. They absolutely needed it. A couple other things that I thought were interesting. Uh, Late game, I thought Patty Mills, it took forever to get Nash to bring Patty Mills back in. This is one I want to hear about in the post game about why he wasn't playing really when they they kind of needed floor spacing late, and he was not with that group. And you can sort of see sometimes when the lanes get closed down, it's because they don't have enough spacing on the court. He played only 28 minutes. He was not shooting very well. And I think you have to just be okay with that. I would be shocked if it was a streaky shooting kind of thing with him because you just don't try to pick and choose your spots about, you know, missing shots or when they're going to go in or when they're not, especially when you have a shooter as good as Patty Mills. Uh, Streaks are not predictive. That's why they end, uh, as we always say. So I really doubt that was the reason. I don't know if they got caught up in a timing thing, but I did find it odd that Patty Mills didn't get back into this game 
a little bit sooner when it sort of seemed clear that they needed him or at least they needed his spacing. So we'll keep an ear out for why that move didn't happen. Uh, luckily, it did not cost them the game in a game where they were trading baskets. Um, but it feels like the move that could have cost them if you're trying to if you're playing games along the margins and you need to seek out every edge, not having a shooter like Patty Mills on the court in a game where you probably were or not even probably where you were trading baskets late. Uh, I think that's an interesting one. So luckily it didn't end up harming them in the overall box score, but we want to, we want to figure out why there was only 28 minutes for him when it was all said and done. We'll get into some of the other role players like Paul Millsap, like James Johnson, who (laughs) the end of this game was so funny. It was like sort of indicative of the whole game that that final play ends up being a busted up play where they double Durant and they don't have a really good plan. And then it ends up in James Johnson's hands for like one of the last shots you probably want as a team, which is James Johnson storming toward multiple guys near the rim and to get fouled and then to make the shots. Um, it just, again, it was like a funny play and in a really physical game with a decent amount of fouls. I thought it probably summed up. It probably summed up why if you're a Knicks fan, you'd be really frustrated and why you're the Nets um, it ended up being a little bit of a bailout <laughs> when it came when it came to the last shot. So we'll talk about his contribution. Talk about Millsap, who looks like you know he goes through these fits and spurts of looking like it's okay and then looking like a struggle. Uh, but in the end, this is what you want: Nets win, back and forth game, national television, two of the superstars. You get them when they need, you need it the most, um, and. It goes down as a W in the book, trading baskets between a bunch of different guys. And that's just, it's just really cool basketball to watch. So we'll get into some more of the minutia later on in the week because there's, you know, a few other ways to dissect what was happening uh, in this game between the Nets, Nets, the Nets and the Knicks. Thanks again for making Locked On Nets your first listen. Uh, make sure you subscribe over to the YouTube channel this episode and more going up over on Locked On Nets YouTube channel. I will put that link in the show notes. Usually Adam gives us a fun little quote on the way out. I'm not as good as him about researching these little tidbits to to throw out there, these little you know, missives, these the little uh, kind of, yeah, little poet. Look, I'm even stumbling here. When I get off when I get off beat with the basketball, it goes, goes, all goes astray. This is where I need my guy Adam. Um, all I'll say is we will be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.